We're all taught the same thing in trade school for HVAC. A long vapor section in an evaporator coil is going to give us a high superheat. But this is just a rule of thumb. It's not an unbreakable rule that will always deliver the same result. A lot of what we learn is the end result of a TXV manipulating and compensating for the true dynamics that are actually occurring in an evaporator coil. When we peel back the TXV, we start to see those true dynamics come out and play. And what we find is often very counterintuitive to what we thought we knew. It's the lesson nobody likes to teach because once we pull that veil back, TXV that's throttled wide open can actually lead to a high superheat. A long vapor zone can actually lead to a low superheat. And on a really hot day when we would think the refrigerant boils earlier in the coil, it can actually start boiling much later. So let me show you how these rules of thumb get broken. And we're gonna do that by focusing on what happens inside of an evaporator coil when you have a fixed orifice metering device. Now this is gonna help you understand TXVs a lot better because when a TXV fails, it often takes on the characteristics of a fixed orifice. Now let's start off on a familiar footing before I start throwing curveballs at you. A fixed orifice metering device has a piston that has a hole through it that never changes in size. Whenever refrigerant flows through a restriction of any kind, whether it's designed or unintentional, there is going to be a change in pressure, and through a fixed orifice, this pressure change is significant. The further apart these two pressures are, the more refrigerant that's going to flow through that orifice. The closer those two pressures are together, the less refrigerant is going to flow through. Now this isn't a lesson on how pistons work, but this part is actually critical to understand what happens when we start throwing monkey wrenches in. Now the next part is just as critical, and that brings us to misconception number two. So here we have two systems, both exactly the same. One is in Miami, Florida. The other is in Tucson, Arizona. In both places, the temperature is the same, 90 degrees. But the relative humidity in Miami is at 80%, while in Tucson, it's only 10%. That humidity is moisture in the air, and the moisture retains heat. But this is heat that we do not detect on our temperature reading of 90 degrees. So there's a whole lot of hidden heat in Miami with a high relative humidity, whereas in Tucson, there's very little moisture in the air and very little of that heat available. Now all the heat and that moisture doesn't release until that moisture condenses on the evaporator coil. And this doesn't happen just in a tiny little section earlier in the coil. It happens over the entirety of the coil itself. And because most of the heat in the air is tied up in that water, it's not readily available early in the evaporator coil. It's just that little bit of sensible heat or that heat in the 90 degree air itself, that dry part of the air. And so the refrigerant has to travel deeper into the coil to pick up that slow gradual release of heat in the condensation process. And that's why the boiling zone extends further into the coil on these really hot, humid days. Now in Arizona, all of the heat in the air is mostly in that sensible heat, that 90 degree temperature. And that heat is immediately available. So as soon as that liquid enters the coil, it has all the heat it needs right there to come up to temperature and boil. So the hotter, the wetter, the stickier, the muggier it is, the deeper into the coil the boiling process is going to be. In those southwestern dry heat days, um, as they say, it's gonna boil pretty quickly. And here it comes, the curveball we've been waiting for. Now when a fixed orifice system first starts up, it overfeeds the coil just a little bit. And so what ends up happening is you get this very, very dense, high mass liquid refrigerant region very early on in the coil. And it doesn't push all the way in. The refrigerant is trying to zig back and forth. There's a lot of resistance there. And it creates this bottleneck. This creates hydraulic back pressure that begins to increase the pressure in that very dense liquid region of the coil. And with this increase in pressure, our differential across the metering device starts to shrink and less refrigerant gets fed in as a result. Now on the other side of this bottleneck, we have a dropping pressure because we're not feeding enough refrigerant into that area. Now during this whole process, we still have heat flowing over the evaporator coil. 
So that highly dense liquid region early in the coil is going to eventually pick up enough heat to start boiling. And that's going to increase a great amount of pressure that's going to start rebounding the pressure in the later part of our coil. Now, eventually, vapor is going to start making its way into the rest of this coil. But the main difference here is that that vapor part of the coil is going to be very dense. It's going to have a high density, high mass vapor region in the coil. And because of that, more refrigerant is going to be able to absorb more heat and spread it out over a larger area. So the temperature of the refrigerant doesn't climb rapidly like it would in a very long vapor section with a very low density vapor refrigerant in it. Now this whole process happens a couple of times in smaller and smaller extremes until the system actually stabilizes. And that's why a lot of technicians will wait 10 minutes before they put any weight into the pressures on their gauges or their temperatures. Now imagine a TXV stuck wide open. The same exact thing is going to happen and it's going to ping pong back and forth until it stabilizes. The only difference is a TXV is probably going to throttle in a lot more refrigerant than a fixed orifice ever could. And this is going to put your compressor at the complete mercy of the load conditions on that day. If we have a very high load, it will evaporate enough refrigerant to protect the compressor. But on those mild days, 75 degrees, that's when the compressor is in some serious trouble. Now, this is only one example of how the rules of thumb can sometimes get broken. But if we understand the process and what's actually happening, we can depend much less on them and we can start actually thinking through these odd and weird readings that don't make any sense to us. Now, I'm not going to ask you to subscribe. Those numbers mean nothing to me, but at least hit the like or leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Hopefully, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.